Hi everyone, I'm John Langley, President-Elect of IDEA. I'd like to welcome everyone to IDEA and TCA's IdeaCon session, Anything But Remote, Inspiring Active and Learning in the Digital Classroom. Today we're here with the following panelists. Mandy Freilich, she's an author, education consultant, a former director of innovation and technology, a technology integrator, and an educator. We're also here with panelist Dr. J.C. Maslick, who's a doctor of education focused in curriculum and instruction. She is an author, an experienced assistant superintendent. We're also here with panelist Scott Noons, a dynamic tech-confused educator, podcaster, blogger, and graphic designer. And finally, our moderator today, Jamie Donnelly, Identity Automation's Director of Engagement, an author, speaker, and former educator. Thank you so much for that awesome introduction, John. I'm so excited to be here with this panel. I was sharing just a few minutes ago before we got started that um, this is like joining friends. We have not been able to be together in person at conferences for now over a year. Actually, my last physical conference was at IdeaCon um, last year. So this is a little bit surreal. But the people that are part of this session just make this session so great, but they also represent various areas of education, which is fantastic. Um, we are all located in different places here in the US. I'm in Texas, Scott is in California, JC is in Pennsylvania, and Mandy is joining us from Wisconsin. So you really do have the North, East, South, and West of the US. And we also come from different perspectives, as you heard in the bio. But what I love about this session is that this is a topic that I think has just been critical in the time of remote learning. It has been something to me that is bothersome in some ways because why can't we try and take these risks now? This is something that ha essentially has been pushed off for a little while because it has been something that has not always been the highest need, right? You have a lot of um, problems that people are facing, big problems that people are facing that have to take that priority. Um, but the way that we're working with our students that within innovation is a critical component of really helping them move and, and grow in this time of remote learning for so many of our students across the US. So we're all gonna be speaking from different perspectives, but I, I can't wait to get started. And I, my first question really is gonna be asking our panelists um, what their greatest struggle is in remote learning. And as we kind of start processing that, what have we been seeing as that struggle, as people have been facing these challenges um, what has been the greatest struggle that they've found specifically in remote learning? And while you're thinking about that, I'm going to go ahead and screen share how um, Identity Automation is supporting this session, and they are giving away our books. So um, this is great. So those of you that are joining us right now have a chance to win this book. Um, my book Mandy's book and Dr. J.C. Maslick's book. So we're all going to be sharing one of our books and signing it and shipping it off to you. At the end of the conference, Identity Automation will take the names that have been placed and, and following through with signing up. And they are gonna select a winner to win all three of those books. So we're really excited to give that out. In addition to that, um, we are also going to be giving out one of our own books out on social media. We just wanna see that you've taken the chance to share with each of us what you have walked away from in this session, something that has inspired you and motivated you to wanna to rethink and, and maybe relearn. And please tag us, we'd love to see that. And we each will be selecting somebody on social media when we're tagged and we will follow up with you um, for a winner of our books as well. So looking forward to giving that out. Um, I also added that in our handout. So I'm gonna stop screen sharing just so you know that information is available to you to follow up in and um, respond in that way as well. So I'm gonna throw this out to you guys. Where do you guys think has been the greatest struggle in this time of remote learning? Uh, 
I think one of the biggest struggles that we've faced is just the idea of connections. And, and I mean that on a lot of different levels. Um, our teachers are missing the connections with students. Our students, I think, are missing the connections with one another. And, and granted, we have great technologies that allow us to establish those relationships and continue that communication. But I think that's been one of the things that's been really tough. In addition to that, just the actual connectivity, I think, can be a concern for districts. And I'd be anxious to hear, you know, again, Jamie mentioned we're all coming from places all over the country. Um, there are parts of my school district that are quite remote and, you know, rural communities where they don't have internet access. And so they're literally physically lacking the connection to their education. And so we've had to take a lot of steps to make sure that um, families and students feel a part of the school community, that they have access to learning. Um, and that's that's certainly been a struggle, um, you know, particularly from the spring and into the fall. I feel like now we're in the swing of things we know um, not, not that we know, because I feel like this is certainly a learning uh, pr progress um, with regards to remote learning, but we're, we're finally getting into the swing of things. And I think um, it's getting better each day. But those initial connections um, personally, physically, I think has has been a challenge for folks. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think yes to everything JC just said, and which has sort of snowballed, snowballed into some other, uh, you know, like mental health issues and belonging issues. And, and um, you know, just I, I never knew how much I love to be hugged prior to the pandemic. And, and I've, I've now realized how much I, I enjoy, you know, the act of a hug. And, um, and all of those things that we really got into education for, um, the, you know, the face-to-face -face interactions, the connections with students, the relationships were um, very much in some ways just one day gone. Um, and, and I think the, the unknowns have been very high. You know, we, first we thought we were coming back in two weeks, and then we thought we were coming back by the end of the year, and then we thought we were coming back at the beginning of the next year, and, and none of that has happened, <clears throat> and we still don't know when we're coming back. Um, really, I mean, we're crossing our fingers for uh, September, but do we really know? No, I mean, we don't know any more than we did a year ago, to be honest. And so um, I think, uh, and I've said this a million times since last March, I've never been more proud to be, to say that I'm in education since the pandemic. Um, what teachers did, uh, what administrators did in a very short period of time, what technology departments did over the course of sometimes 24 hours is crazy and phenomenal. Um, but we also didn't have some of the proactive pieces in place like what do, what do best practices of online learning actually mean? You know, what, what, does, that, what does that really look like? Um, because had we had some of those practices in place, um, it would have been a tiny bit potentially less stressful than it was for everybody. Um, and so I think one of the greatest challenges that I've seen is, is that, you know, teachers were stressed because they didn't know how to do things online. Administrators were stressed because they didn't know how to help teachers do things online because nobody had really taken the time to figure out what that you know, what online learning really looks like. And so, um, and, you know, that just led into a whole bunch of mental health issues. So I guess that was one of the big, the big pieces I saw in many different districts that I was working with. All right, Scott, are you still with us? He may be frozen, but guess what? He's on here actively in the chat, which has been great. You know, it's California Wi-Fi. That's what we can blame it on. <laughs> either, either he's frozen or he's super good at the whole statue game. One of the two. Like, I, I think one great. of the things that Jamie was saying that, that connected to um, Russell mentioned in the chat, um, he said that not every teacher is tech savvy. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, you know, all of that came to the surface very quickly when we had to, you know, as an administrator, we had to scramble and work on training that would meet every teacher where they were. And I mean, that runs, you know, 
quite a range. I mean, we had folks who were used to posting videos and were very engaging in their general instruction with tech tools and, and having digital assignments and collaborating and communicating with students online. And there were some teachers who had never even tiptoed into that. So designing professional development was also very challenging just because it had to be so personalized. Mm -hmm. um, and again, uh, Russell in the chat definitely uh, hit on that fact. Right. I see Lisa. Oh, yay, Scott. <laughs> we can't hear you. Not yet, but I see Lisa is joining us from Texas, which is great. We have a lot of TCEA folks joining us here um, at IdeaCon, which has been wonderful to get connected to these two state conferences. So um, as Scott's getting that set up, um, I'm just going to point out that um, some of the responses that you're facing and, and things that you're going through as well. We want to see those responses because that's actually, you know, this is applicable for us all. We're all facing different situations. I remember when I I would share sessions on live streaming. This is years ago before the AR VR uh, itch came, but I would share sessions on live streaming and nobody would ever come. I mean, we would maybe have a few people and then I would share it on something simple, like, you know, I don't know, scavenger hunts or whatever. And then I'd have a whole group. Everybody's active. Live streaming, nothing. And I was just like, what is going on? And I would talk to administrators. I would talk to people like, why are you resisting this? Like, this is a technology we have available. So when you talk about snow days, this is totally possible right now. And they're like, yeah, I mean, one day we'll get there. We're just not there. Like, it was never a priority to get them there. It was just let's just keep passing the buck on that. And then as soon as COVID hit, I remember everybody that would listen, I'd be like, all this time, nobody wanted to do live streaming, you know, but you know, at the end of the day, um, I, I agree with you, JC, there's a lot of teacher training that has to go into effect that we ask teachers, students, parents, administrators to do something that nobody had ever done before. And in the midst of that, we were really expecting this glorious experience. We all hit roadblocks like we've never seen. And funny story is we went remote here for a season for many uh, parents opted in in our school district, whether or not they wanted to be remote. We had about 75% of our students from the beginning of the school year, we have went all year long. So we've had in-class instruction for our students. So we're kind of the exception across the country for sure. Um, but in light of that, I will say that we just had unprecedented snow come in and just slam us here in Texas. Um, I actually still have snow in my backyard, which is just unbelievable. Like we're on day 10. Um, but, you know, with that, you're like, you know, how, you know, remote learning. We've prepared everybody. Everybody knows where to go. And guess what? All the schools shut down. I, there's something to be said, like you said, JC, about access because we lost electricity. We lost. So there was some functionality issues that were really something we could not overcome, even in light of that. Um, so, you know, it I, I blew my mind because I was like, well, everybody that can join. But, you know, equity. Right. If I if I'm offering it, I have to offer it to everybody, not just the people that have the device and the appropriate technology and the appropriate skill set. Like that, that's not okay. You know, this should be available to everyone. So I think we're we're honing in on some deeper issues that are really happening in schools beyond just this isn't here. We didn't have it. We needed training. Like there is a lot of aspects that needed to be in place and still need to be in place to really serve all of our students. So Scott, did you want to add? Thank you for joining us. Yeah, back. yeah. My audio is working now, right? Okay, sweet, sweet. So I'll jump right in with that training. So here locally, we busted out the training, piggybacking off of Mandy too, right? Teachers, staff, admin, all rose to the occasion. We ran 110 webinars in eight days. Like it just blew my mind. We prepped all of this and ran all of this and teachers showed up um, when they didn't have to during their spring break. They gave up time to work and produce this content for other teachers, other educators. But honestly, we still we still fell short because we were hitting 
towards the middle and the high end of the tech spectrum. And what we quickly realized is those on the lower end really opted out. So we really had to develop a plan and include some stakeholders to figure out what their needs were. And we're still doing that work. It's really hard to bring this tech to everybody where they are. And I think we've done a really good job at chunking it really small. For example, uh, I'm coming from the secondary level. And now I have to cover everything from TK all the way to 12. And so for those little littles, our four and five-year-olds, right, we're working on the most basic skills. How do you power on your device and things like that? How what if you lose your tab? How do you bring that tab back up? What if you're in a Microsoft Teams meeting using your conferencing tool and you need to turn on your camera or switch to your browser? How do you do that? And it's actually a lot of onboarding. So we've really developed a lot of plans for that. And in terms of providing access, getting hotspots, devices. We also had to roll out about 15,000 devices that first month, which was just crazy. And we had everybody from cafeteria staff to paras to uh, registered nurses and parent volunteers to just help out uh, campus security, right? Nobody's on campus. So they're out there handing out food and uh it was just amazing. STEM kits, all, all these things that make learning accessible, right? Thinking of Maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs, right? You, you need those most basic needs met. And I can only imagine the challenge right now for Texans like you, Jamie, with uh, losing uh, kind of these things we take for granted, like potable water and and power, just kudos to all the Texans. Not only do they have big hearts, but wow, talk about ingenuity and stick with itness. Uh, the tenacity just uh, really speaks volumes to what educators can do in a pinch. Yeah, big hearts and big hair, right? Isn't that what they say? <laughs> <laughs> Again, I'm really from California, that's why. Um, but, you know, I, I will say that I completely agree that the things that our different schools and states are facing beyond just the pandemic, right? I mean, it's just like, it, it's almost like the needle that just one more drop, I don't know if I can handle it. Um, so I think that, I think at the end of the day, when we're looking at and understanding where we're at, um, you got to ask, like, what are those like you said, those basic needs, what are, if we're asking people to be innovative, but yet they can't connect, um, if we're asking people to think outside the box, but yet they don't have a technology piece in their home, or like I see in, in our chat, people are talking about remote, you know, being so remote that they don't have access to the, in, to the internet. And while I, I will say that, you know, cost really is a huge factor for sure, even in Texas, I was fortunate I never lost power. But apparently I'm also not fortunate because I didn't lose power because I am hearing about $16,000 electricity bills because of last week that people are going to face. So I'm just waiting for the day my electricity bill comes in um, because they are charging us like insane prices because of the demand, right? Um, so you're you think about what, what needs to take place? What What is the foundation our schools, our districts, education as a whole really need to address in order to really start thinking about that innovative learning and teaching? Well, I think it's, I think it's super important to just acknowledge a few things here. Um, one of those being that like what happened in Texas was basically like pretty close to an apocalypse, right? Like that's not something that happens very often, um, as does a pandemic. Also not something that happens very often. And one of the things I think we have forgotten uh, very quickly is that one day this pandemic is going to end, right? And we've spent a lot of time being very reactive, um, you know, um, there are things that we know to be true. We know that online learning was never meant for the masses. It was never built for every child. It was built as an alternative way to learn for students who are struggling in a brick and mortar setting. And so 
from that, you know, there's there's things that we need to remember when we make decisions for the whole. Um, hybrid learning, Hi hybrid learning or high flex learning, I don't care which one you're doing, should never be a thing. That having students in front of you and having to teach concurrently to another student at home, I don't know whose idea was that, but I'm just going to say right now, it was dumb. And what I think happened was somebody at some table in some district said, let's do this. And everybody else at the table was like, okay, let's try that. And it was a dumb idea. And we went with it anyway. And so hybrid learning should never be a thing either. What that means is that one day the pandemic's going to end and we really just need to do the absolute best we can to get through this in order to get to the other side. Um, decisions that we're making in hybrid, I, I'm, I'm going to pick on hybrid learning because I despise it so much. Um, the thing, the decisions that we're making don't make sense. If you have students coming in an A, B format, the reason we did this was to keep them from getting a virus. Like we have to try to remember why we were making these decisions to begin with. And if you, if they can get the, the virus in 24 hours, having an AB format doesn't make sense. So a lot of times I think that we have, we have forgotten why we started doing this to begin with. And, and it was to avoid people getting sick, period. It wasn't because we thought this was going to be the end all be all. It wasn't because we thought this was actually going to work. We were doing what we had to do in order to get through. And why I think it's so important to remember that is because as we look forward, like we're very stuck in this pandemic mindset right now, right? And we're we're so um, you know, agitated about like what students are coming to school and, and what 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 if they're not showing up to their class because they're sleeping in or whatever it is, or or how do we get teachers to remember to, you know, um, get onto their Google Classroom or bring them up to where they needed to be? This was temporary. Now what we can do is we can start to look forward and take the best things out of the pandemic and start moving forward with that and start looking to the future, right? Um, and to be honest, some of the best things, and, and JC and, and everybody's mentioned this so far, some of the best things that happened in the pandemic were we were made acutely aware how important relationships are. Um, you know, how how much we miss, like if, if there's anything I hope teachers take out of this pandemic, it's that they remember to like hug their first graders a little bit longer the next time they see them or make that extra connection with the high schoolers in the hallway. And and so I think it's really important that we keep those things in mind. Like this is not meant to be long term. Um, it's meant to keep people safe and so I don't know why I had to go on that soapbox, but I felt it was very important that I get my feelings out there about hybrid learning. So I'm done now. Scott, you're not you're not frozen this time, but we are ready to hear from you. No, you're ready. <laughs> yeah, I would just second what Mandy was saying, uh, somebody had put in the chat that they almost fell out of their chair when she was talking about a hybrid learning and the problems with it. And it's so challenging. Uh, we do that where I'm at. We do a combination of distance learning and hybrid learning and hybrid learning by far is the most challenging in my opinion. And Mandy's absolutely right. Going into this, this was a temporary thing. And I think we have to get back to focusing on that. Yes, we've been in this pandemic mode for a while, but let's stop spinning our wheels so much and let's take what we've learned, these, these lessons like relationships, upping 21 first century skills, right? Giving students those opportunities. Let's take the best of that learning and then figure out how we're going to incorporate that when things do kind of get back to normal rather than trying to pivot with the next thing. I mean, have a general plan, of course, and I think most districts by now have that, 
we're, we're kind of in survival mode, but let's really focus on shifting gears to not only surviving, but thriving post pandemic. Let's work towards getting there and really leveraging those relationships. And maybe we need to revisit how things are done. Let's make uh, parents, teachers, students, more active stakeholders within our overall kind of ecosystem here in education. I'd love to see more of that. Yeah, I agree with what you said, Scott, there, especially at the end. I mean, we will all have a momentous opportunity when, whenever this ends, right, when we go back to normal, to say, what should we be going back to, right? Like, what lessons did we learn throughout this? Maybe there were great things that should stick and should stay with us, and maybe there are other practices that we should be throwing away and never going back to ever again. Clearly, Mandy feels that way about hybrid learning. Um, you know, we're in a hybrid model in my district, and it's mostly in response to parent and community needs. That's what they asked for, and we've been trying our best to be as responsive as, as we possibly can. Um, you know, it's not an optimal situation. You know, somebody was mentioning in the chat that they're, you know, kind of struggling and feeling like they're not doing the best job. Listen, no one's ever gone through this before. We're all trying our best to survive and keeping kids at the heart of the decisions that we're making. Not every decision that we're making is the best one, but I think in the very near future, I think teams are gonna need to sit down and say, okay, we have a chance to change the tra trajectory moving forward. What are we going to do? What, what things do we value most of all? You know, it is that technology, is that, hands-on learning? Um, you know, is it those relationships? And how are we going to embed those things into the core of what we're going to be all about, you know, as we head into, you know, the 21-22 school year? Yeah, I think, I mean, Mandy touched on this and, and really said, you know, we shouldn't be so focused on the kids that, that are sleeping and, and or playing a video game I, I hate to say this, but I have to get on to my son about that all the time right now. Um, and he's in college. I'm like, are you seriously playing a game right now where your teacher's speaking? Like, this is not okay, you know? And and it's like catching him and he's 20. I'm like, this is ridiculous. So a 20 year old is not capable of doing that. Um, and you have all these kids at home with all these distractions, right? Um, and what do we do in the classroom? We're constantly trying to eliminate the distra distractions. I think. This has been something that for me, a topic that I have been super concerned with from day one. Um, and that is, a, it is attendance um, and, and certainly engagement. But I think our step one has to be to get them there. If we are missing kids, what action is school taking to go and get those kids back on track? And I feel like that is a lifelong discussion in education. Like, that has never been solved. We just consistently lose more and more kids in time. And that's a shame. I think that is one, our very first obstacle that we've got to overcome. But instead of focusing on like ways we can connect with those kids that are not showing up online or not showing up into the classroom, and we've lost such a massive amount of students in this process, and it is absolutely the equity on that is the problem. Like they, we are missing our students that need to be there the most. And I think that it is it, we need to take more time to really rethink how to get those kids back, um, how we can meet them where they're at, how we can support them. And that's going to involve a lot more than just money. That's going to involve a lot more than making a phone call which is what we've always done, right? Send a note home, you know, you're in truancy, you're facing this, you're facing that, you know, this is where you need to be. Um, we have kids lost right now and, and we need to figure out ways and that's gonna involve a lot more of our community. It's gonna be a lot more of innovative thinking of how we can connect with those kids beyond just maybe a phone call, maybe walking up to their doors and knocking maybe trying to find out where those kids are actually located now because there's been so much transition and change, job loss. Um, there is there is so many issues that we're facing, but we really need to get to the heart of how many kids are, are gone right now 
And that is frightening. This is something that's going to affect us for at least the next decade. These kids that are lost in the mix. And all we can think about is, you know, innovation. Like, hey, wait, there are some foundational things. One is the kid has to be there, right? Um, so you, I think that the partnership, I, I think JC mentioned this, and so did maybe Scott, our communities are key. This is not a journey that we can do independently. It is really about, and, and I actually think this issue with COVID was the best thing that could have ever happened because I feel like our schools told our communities what was going to happen. And that is not okay. These are our children, you know, and just like you don't want your child going into something and having no clue and being disconnected. Did it create some turmoil at the beginning because there was a lot of confusion? Yes. But does, does it mean that there should be a partnership? That is what it exposed is that we are doing our own thing. There was an expectation you're taking care of my kids from this time to this time while I take care of this, right? And at the end of the day, um, that disconnect is just a disservice to our students. So it really is about build, rebuilding that public relation within the community again and, and getting those parents to be part of this journey with us and, and community. So getting those communities to go and reach out to these kids and it, it really all of us come together. And I know that sounds like this big wish list that will never happen, which is why it doesn't happen. But, you know, we got to take action on that. I, I really feel like there is I've been very concerned from the get go. And it's just growing because it's really not being addressed like it should be. So um, I think that leads me into this next question, because, you know, we talked about what are schools facing? What are some things that need to be in place? What 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 are some foundational things to get us in the process of innovation? But, you know, looking at this third question, what are those greatest opportunities? Because I think all of us have seen people just do. I, I mean, it's like, how is that even possible? How did anybody even think about that? You know, I I have witnessed on social media alone teachers doing the coolest most creative, amazing things to connect with their students, to really hone in on that learning and to really show how much they are, are, are they love their students, they're invested. Um, I've seen just the most amazing things. So I would love to hear kind of some things that you guys have seen, either school districts or classroom teachers or education as a whole, really transitioning and, and doing now that have been um, you know, a light at the end of the tunnel. We can see some great opportunities with that. I'll go with that one. Uh, some things that we did early on, uh, I was still in the classroom at the start of the pandemic and then shifted to this new role as uh, an instructional technology coach. And when I was in the classroom, one of the things that I caught on to right away when people were opting out are students, and it was harder to track them down, right, um, with everything going on and their parents were losing jobs and things like that, phone calls home. And then finding people that could do those home visits and just do a wellness check. Hey, are you okay? What What do you need in taking care of those those basic needs, getting student services, uh, when and where they exist and where they're needed, filling in those gaps and just really looking at the whole student. So of course, academics are one of our top priorities, but just overall wellness. And I know Mandy's going to have a lot to say on that too. And um, JC too, in terms of logistics. And I think also in terms of like your teaching style, I think it really challenged the status quo. We have to now be part entertainer to compete with video games, YouTube, Netflix, all the streaming services that are at our fingertips 24 seven. And so whether we like it or not, we have to do that. And one, one cool thing that I've seen educators do, can't really see it, but I got a colored light here. So establishing like, a nice inviting environment. You got your light there too, right? Uh, getting good lighting, getting good sound, switching up the lighting. I've seen a math teacher set up his lessons like a Twitch stream. And for those that don't know, Twitch is generally um, a video gaming kind of social media where students can watch other people play video games and, and learn and chat and interact. And, um, uh, 
it's highly communicative. So if we're thinking about the four C's, the four C's are there on Twitch. Let's tap into those things and uh, make learning exciting for these students and engaging so that they want to come into our classrooms and learn and let's go beyond uh, what's been possible in the last decade or so. And I, I think the environment right now is ripe with opportunity, as you've alluded to, Jamie. Right now is the, the time to test these things and experiment. Let's explore and ideate on what's possible and let's construct something that's going to, you know, really further us in the upcoming decades. Um, so I, I agree with Scott in full that I have seen teachers do like phenomenal things. And I want to give a shout out to Melissa Hayes on Twitter, who I have seen her over and over and repeatedly do unbelievable things with her students online. And I had the, uh, you know, I was able to be a part of her class at one point and her kids are mesmerized by her. And, um, you know, there really are, uh, somebody had said in the chat, there are teachers who are, you know, surviving and thriving throughout this that actually love the challenge of online learning. And um, there were, a, when the, the pandemic first started, I had worked with some of them and, it, you know, in districts that were coast to coast, so it didn't matter the place they were in. It was different districts that mattered to the district. And, and there were these people. And I asked, you know, I asked over and over again, what were the things that they had in place uh, prior to the pandemic? And the answers that I got were, uh, which not everybody loves to hear, but they had a self-care regimen in place prior to the pandemic. Um, so yes, I'm saying the S word, like self-care was a, a thing that they were doing before. And they continued to do it throughout the pandemic. Um, also, they had elements of personalized learning in their classroom prior to the pandemic hitting. And one of the reasons why I think that that is true, that they were that was helping them survive and thrive was that so many elements of um, the best practices in online learning are, are built upon uh, personalized learning. And so I feel like for that, it was a little bit easier of a transition for them. And then the third thing was, is that they at least had an interest in technology or the willingness to fail and grow. And so those three things, along with like a robust district support, were the things that were consistently hands down a part of those questions, those conversations with teachers. And so there are absolutely people surviving and thriving. And and I think, um, you know, we can learn from that and take it moving forward as to how can we build resilience um, for things that might happen with this again. That is a fantastic opportunity. Um, lately, the big uh, the big thing I've been being brought into discuss with districts is how to um, go back into the next year, how to start out the next year um, and uh, you know, after the pandemic, assuming that the pandemic is done. And what I've been working with them on is it feels a little retro, to be honest, but it is true, true blue blended learning. Um, not some of the stuff that districts have been calling blended learning, which is not blended learning, but the actual pedagogical approach of blended learning. And, um, you know, because when you look at, at, like, say, the rotation model or the flex model or one of those, um, you know, flipped model, however you want to look at the at the blended learning models, one piece of that is always the online component that is typically your direct instruction component. We have that. Like how awesome is it to be able to use every all of the work that you've put in during the pandemic and and use that in in an actual pedagogical practice that works for students, that allows you to create better relationships, uh, do small group and uh, work small uh, with small groups with students in one on one. And um, when people ask me about concurrent teaching, you know, how should they do hybrid or concurrent teaching? That's uh, that is always where I go to um, is actually blended learning, because if you have if you continue to keep your instruction online and you teach your um, you teach your in-person students like they're online versus your online students like they're in person, it allows you to uh, have your students learning online and still connect with those students in person in small groups and one-on-one -on -one, along with the students who are online small groups and one-on-one. -on -one. And so um, that is that is one of the ways that 
that I've been working with teachers to to help them take sort of the best things out of out of the pandemic and find those opportunities to really, um, you know, do the things that we're talking about we're missing right now, which is create connections with other humans. And um, so those are some things, opportunities that I've seen as I've worked with districts. Um, I would just echo, you know, Mandy said about the opportunity to fail and grow. And I think um, Scott mentioned something about like, what a better time to take a risk and try something. I think that in itself has become a key opportunity, at least for a lot of the teachers that I work with. Um, you know, y yes, you're going to try things and they may fail, but that's OK, because we're in a point right now where we are learning. We're learning our way through this new normal, through this new type of learning. And so we have to be able to put ourselves out there and say, you know what, I don't know if this lesson's going to bomb or not, or I don't know if this tool is going to work or if it's going to really meet the needs for this lesson that I've created. But we have to be willing to take that chance. And I think the real successes that I've observed within my district and in other districts that I work with are those individuals who have stepped maybe outside of their comfort zone a little bit, what, again, whether it's to try a new tool or try a new strategy or to give some ownership in the digital world over to their students, which is a huge risk in itself. And they've seen that pay off and they're like, OK, I, I can do this. I, I can. I don't have to be the host of the meeting. I can turn that over to my student who can serve as a lead learner and think about all the the empowerment that not only that kid feels, but the other kids in the class as well. And um, so, I mean, I'm thinking of so many of, of my teachers that have really been able to put themselves out there and try that during this last year, and they've seen positive results. And so I do think that, um, I do think that it's an opportunity for them to just take a chance on something that maybe they never thought they could do before. Yeah, I, I just, and Scott, you're unmuted. So if you wanted to do something, say something to that, feel free to let me know. Um, but I I think, and I'm going to point out somebody that has made a difference for me and my kids. Um, Heather Brantley is a teacher here in my school district. And um, my daughter, it was her former teacher last year. And Heather was you know, at the beginning of the year, um, she had called me at one point or sent me a message, uh, started off with remind, you know, and then later, as we got more and more connected, she would send me a text, but, you know, letting me know about how my daughter's doing. And um, there was an instance where she didn't bring her jacket and it was cold. And she said, hey, I have a jacket for her. just letting you know it's coming home with her today, if you can just make sure to send that back. Um, letting, you know, giving her own jacket to her students. And, and, you know, at first it almost was like, well, is this person for real? You know, you, you don't know exactly how to take it. The more that I get to know Heather, the more I realize she's so genuine and cares so much about her students. And in the pandemic was so intent on making sure she was connecting with them personally and individually. Um, in the midst of this pandemic, I mean, she has tried innovative things that she had never tried before. And it really isn't for her. It, it was for them. You know, she was taking these risks because she wanted to do the best for her students in the midst of this. And I just love that. So she, her and I actually at TCEA earlier in the month um, did a session together because I was like, hey, I'm doing these sessions. Do you want to join me? And she's like, yeah, can I join with my students? You know, TCA doesn't do that. It's all about the teachers, right? And I was like, sure, let's do it. So she joined in with her students and you can see the camera guys like, how are we gonna get everybody in this view and the lighting? And I mean, he's frantic because he has to make sure it looks perfect. I'm like, forget it, this is authentic. This, if we're gonna talk about immersive technology, she's doing it. This is the exact example. I could sit here until my face is blue about all the things you can do, but she is doing it. Look at these kids. So they were coming up with their projects and they were sharing like, like it was just an ed camp, you know, like it was just like, okay, it was so great. And I, you know, she invited me to come and be at her, at her class for Global Maker Day this year. Um, 
So I had a chance to go in and be with her students for part of that time. I mean, she has went above and beyond. And what I found out that Heather's always been like this. This has always been her nature. But in the midst of this crisis, she really has stepped it up. And again, going back, she'll meet me at night. She was texting me at different times. It was never about her. And and I know, going back to the self-care, Mandy, um, that some of our teachers are really struggling right now. And this is a, a difficult season for them, just like it's a difficult season for our students. And, um, you know, I really appreciate that she was at a good place to be able to support her students. And I think that those are some elements for her that she had to be there to be able to be good for, you know, the students that she served. And my daughter is going to be forever grateful for Miss Brantley. And actually, she's running for uh, Teacher of the Year with TCEA. So if you're listening, TCEA, you need to really think about Heather Brantley because she's phenomenal. I'm going to go into that fourth question. Um, and I'm seeing, by the way, I did see a question put in Q&A by Lisa. I will ask that here at the end. Definitely want to address that. Um, but we have two more questions to go, and and then we're going to go back and kind of reflect on some of the things being said. And feel free to respond with reflection because the, the responses have been fantastic. But um, how does security play a role in innovation? And that has been something that may seem like, whoa, where did that come from, Jamie? Security. Like we just talked about loving kids and giving them hugs, you know, and now we're talking about security. But um, I think that the reason why that's an important question right now is because school isn't super good about thinking about security first. Right. We usually kind of jump in something without thinking about the ramifications until something bad happens. And then we are, oh, bad backtrack. Right. Um, so there has to be a balance. There has to be a protection. If we're asking our students to, uh, to go in head first, then we are just as responsible to make sure they're safe when they go in. Um, so I think that there are some measures that, you know, that maybe people haven't thought about and maybe some of the things that you guys have faced because we, just like unprecedented times with this pandemic, we're in unprecedented times for um, cyber attacks right now on our students because we're asking them to go into places that they are not familiar, trained, prepared for. So I, I'm curious as to your thoughts um, and, and dealing with security and why does security play a role to make sure that our students have the opportunity to be innovative? Well, I don't I don't know if I would, eat, I would only say students, I would too, right? Um, and I think, uh, you know, I was like, I was a, a director of innovation and technology. And, and one of the things that I feel like teachers have um, that, that is maybe not made clear often by tech departments is that a lot of times when we say no, or <laughs> we ask you not to use something, it actually is due to privacy issues. Um, and because teachers don't need to know or understand privacy issues typically. And so that is part of the tech department's job, right? And I was always acutely aware of the sort of, um, you know, catch 22 of locking down what can be used um, because of privacy and security issues and versus asking people to be innovative. And, and there's, um, you know, there's, there's definitely um, there's a balance there that needs to be found. And frankly, we didn't have the time to find it during the pandemic. And so I have worked with districts who have done everything from use whatever you want as long as you're teaching to, nope, you can use these three tools. <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> and then there's everything in between. Um, and And so I think one of the things that, is going to be important moving forward is to make it very clear why and how we are deciding what tools we do and do not use. Um, you know, I think it was very 
kind of many ed tech companies to allow teachers to do trials during the pandemic. Um, it was also a fantastic marketing tool as they didn't want to let it go and the pandemic's going to be over. Um, but in many cases, there are issues with the privacy, the terms of use, the security, how much data is being transferred. Um, like those are all a, a big security and privacy issue for our students. Um, but definitely it's also something that, uh, you know, as a tech department, you have to try to balance with how, you know, with the ability to be innovative as well. Yeah, I would agree with what Mandy was saying. Um, I recall uh, about six years ago having a conversation with a, a guy in our tech department, and um, I said to him, you're going to have to let us use Twitter. And you would have thought I was saying, like, unleash the hounds. I mean, he was mortified because everything had been so locked down previously that no people were afraid to even come and ask for an app or, hey, I need access to this website. And I believe that it's because there was no dialogue around the purpose. You know, it, years ago, Twitter was seen as this, you know, oh, social media, it's for celebrities, whatnot. I mean, I, clearly we've moved fa past that. We know there is true educational value in the collaboration that we find in social media networks. Um, but that even is impacting our students. I mean, I know that students in my school district are connected to kids across the country because their teachers are on Twitter. And that's an awesome thing to give to a student that ability to share their voice in places beyond their school walls, right? So I think there have to be conversations around the instructional side. You know, here's the tool that we want to use and here's why. And the tech side of, well, you know, here are our concerns with whatever, using this tool. And here are some of the things we'd like to have in place just to keep everybody safe. I just think that there has to be a conversation um, and, it, and it needs to be focused in on why we are doing this and what is it doing for kids. Yeah, I want to piggyback off that. Uh, opening up the conversation is essential. Having been on the teacher side recently and feeling kind of trapped and not fully understanding the process and the security issues, right? It It's paramount that we protect our kids, but yet at the same time, we need to operate and provide the least restrictive environment, not only in terms of access to paper and pencil, but to these digital tools and what they can do. And we need to leverage them to uh, their fullest capabilities, essentially. But we have to do so safely and we need uh, teams of stakeholders to be able to come in and share out uh, what's needed, why it's needed, and then uh, teams of individuals in the know to kind of fact check like, oh, is this tool in fact safe? Does this tool do what it says it's going to do? And is it something that we really need? Does it fill a need? Or maybe is there uh, another tool that we already support that does the same thing? That way you're not having thousands or hundreds of choices and you're not limited to just a, you know, a small amount. I really like what you had to say about Twitter as well, JC. I think a lot of districts need to be open to that because that's where I go to. I'll tell you what, I hopped on this morning. I have a band of Schoology friends and they started reporting issues on Schoology. Guess what? I took that information, shared it with our IT team this morning and averted a possible crisis because uh, I was on it. And, you know, I wish there were more people doing that because we could avoid many more mistakes because we're better together. And so cool that your students and your teachers are able to connect and go beyond. I'm seeing a lot of states um, kind of embed in their standards, this interconnectivity. So kudos to you. Very cool. Thank you. Yeah. 100 percent because when you're thinking about what's best um there i think you're spot on jc we've got to have that open communication and like J scott said there's going to be times where you're going to find a better resource um that provide you know the best opportunity and safety for our students 
um, just by having a conversation as to what are you looking to gain from this, right? Like what is the necessary aspects of this tool that you need to have? Because this one clearly does not fit. Actually, um, Illinois is one of the first states that's going to require school districts here to have a data privacy officer as far as across all the districts. Of course, districts are probably scrambling right now uh, because it's like, well, what's that? <laughs> What are you talking about? And you think about it, and why have we not had that in place already? I mean, why is Illinois the first one to call it out during a pandemic when we're getting slammed by hackers and, and our information? We're giving out our information so easily to these companies, like Mandy said. And it's like, well, where exactly is that going? Have we asked that? Do we know that? We don't know because we're not really reading about that fine print and we're not really taking the time to investigate that. And that is a concern. That's on us. We're responsible to keep them safe. So they're there. We've got to be held accountable. And I love the fact that the state is actually looking at ways to make sure the safety is there for our kids and our staff. Mandy. Yeah. And I think, too, um, kind of, you know, out of what you're saying, I think. There is a um, there needs to be a balance in the level of transparency, right? Because again, it's not necessarily teachers' jobs to know privacy in terms of use, and yet they need to know privacy in terms of use. And so, you know, I I, I think back to we we've been working on on this in Wisconsin for years, and um, many years ago when somebody said to me, well, you know can you, according to the terms of use, can you use it with your students? And I was like, what now? Like when I check that little box that actually means something when it says terms of use, like I have no idea what that means. I just thought it meant like, if you want to use it, you can. Oh, I know I want to use it. So I'm going to check that box. Like, I don't actually know what that means. And, um, you know, and I think we're getting better about that, this now, right? Because that was years ago. But um you know, it's it's a delicate balance between giving people too much information that they're not going to remember because it's not really their job to have to remember something like that, like they're teaching kids um, and being able to still allow them to to choose between uh, tools and, and to manage that privacy. And um, and I've always really been an advocate of don't use 5000 tools use, you know, have your go-to tools and know them really, really well. Um, branch out every now and then and try something new. Absolutely. But, you know, you can do so much of what you want to do with certain tools. You just don't know it well enough to be able to do it with it. Mm -hmm. And so be innovative in the tools that you do use um, instead of using, because it's not innovative to use 5,000 tools. It's, it's innovative to use a few tools in many different ways. And um, and if you do that, then you can be more comfortable with what you're using is following the terms of use. And you don't have to constantly be in anxiety mode that you might be putting your your kids uh, information out there, um, you know, without in without security and privacy. OK, I we have three minutes to go, but I want to make sure we answer Lisa's question here. Um, she was saying in Texas schools, many schools are concurrent, meaning students are face-to-face -face and remote. Um, what recommend, recommendations do you have to make this sustainable? So just real quickly, if you guys could take a, a minute to just share what recommendation have you seen it work positively? Um, Mandy is going to just, I'm sure, nail it, nail it on this one. Um, but if you guys have any recommendations to make sure that we are meeting the needs for the ones coming into the classroom as well as the ones working remote at the same time. Do you want to go, Mandy? <laughs> well, first, let me say I'm so sorry that you have to that you have to do concurrent teaching. Um, and as a side note, one of the as I work with educator mental health and demoralization and disengagement, uh, the teachers that I see the most disengagement from are actually the ones doing hybrid learning. So keep your eyes out for that and make sure that you're, you know, taking care of yourself and doing all those wellness things. Um, I'd have to go back to what I said about uh, teaching students, um, you know, teach your in-person students as if they're online um, and then 
instead of teaching your online students like they're in person. Now, I don't mean ignore your students. That is not what I mean by that, because I did see a tweet out there on something like that. And I thought, oh, my gosh, I hope they didn't get that from me. What I mean is um, use your online, you know, use use uh, whatever LMS that you have or that you're using, continue to use that for your direct instruction. And then use the time that you have because students are it, almost the idea of a flipped or blended classroom, right? It's kind of the same idea. Um, allow your students to kind of have some voice choice and pacing in uh, within that online course, and then use that time to meet with small groups with students, to meet one-on-one -on -one with students, to make appointments with your online, your virtual students to, to meet with them. And, and that sort of, it will be less anxiety for you as well as you're, as you're trying to teach that way. Now, well said. 100%. I, I think that's spot on. Um, they, I just want to point out one last thing. If you didn't already sign up, you can scan that QR code or you can go to the bit.ly, uh, created a shortened URL for you for those of you that aren't going to scan a QR code. Um, but you can sign up and have a chance to win for by the end of the conference. There'll be an announcement of who won again for us. Um, we are doing a social media post where if you can share something that you walked away with today, we're, we'll be happy to select you and, and send you out a book. We, we hope to find some great inspiration of things that you've learned to share with others as well. So um, if you haven't had a chance, you have a chance to sign up as well as in the handouts, you can go back to that. And I just want to thank Scott, JC, Mandy. Thank you so much for joining in today and sharing your expertise and your experience and and your heart to see education thrive in the midst of remote learning and outside of remote learning. Um, and hopefully this will be a way for us to stay connected with you. So we would love to stay connected. Our handles are up at the very top of the chat. Um, we would love to stay connected on social media and, and hear the things that your classroom is doing, the innovative choices you're making and how you've approached that so we can share that with others. So thank you guys so much. Thank, thank you. you. Bye everyone. Bye guys, bye-bye.